Welcome to the wisdomfactory.net. I'm Heidi and I'm doing interviews with interesting people. And today I have Robert Korbold is your name. And Doctor. I find it really interesting because he is starting a new way of doing podcasts. You know, as I do, we are sitting together. I mean, one beside the other, but far away and we are talking heads. He is doing without pictures, seems to me and is doing it quite differently. So I would like to explore a little bit with him what his motivations were, whom he wants to reach, and why he does it in the way he, he is doing it. So, but before we do that, can you tell me a little bit about you? You are in the UK, as I see from your, also from the, from the website, co book <laughs> at the end. So tell me a little bit about you. Um, well, I'm from this, sort of southwest of England, um, quite a sort of privileged background, um, very lucky, big family, um, and sort of trotted along quite happily first 21 years of my life, quite a nice little bubble, um, didn't think too much about the problems of the world, was quite sort of protected, quite happy, go lucky. And then aged uh, 21, I had a, a massive spiritual awakening. Um, which, uh, and sort of left me in a kind of non-dual state for, um, well, a sort of few moments. And then the sort of glow of that lasted about 24 hours. And um, since then, I've been going on a process of intellectual inquiry and a process of spiritual inquiry to try and find out what that was that happened to me. And um, during that journey, I stumbled across the ideas of a man called John Stewart. And it was like um, being hit by a thunderbolt. I knew that I was looking at my purpose in life, I suppose. Um, and his message sort of uh, massively changed the way I look at the world. And since then, I've been trying to find ways to uh, spread that message. And I've worked for educational charities. So I did a lot of um, working with kids sort of inspiring them to make the world a better place. Um, and then more recently have been trying to put that evolutionary message into a podcast and a website and a blog um, to try and sort of shift our cultural worldview um, out of the sort of modern and postmodern worldviews and value systems um, and the traditional value system that has, you know, has been um, the three of those have been going to war recently and to try and shift us to a sort of evolutionary or integral worldview which can integrate the best of all those worldviews and move us forward um, and and in fact you know move the whole, whole evolutionary process forward um, and to participate in that and that's really um, what that evolutionary message is all about. So with other plain words to help uh, to have the world a better place and inspire people to do their part to create a better a better not a better life but better conditions as we have today by helping them to go into another mindset. Is it what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's certainly part of it. I mean, I would say that's, that there's nothing new about that, right? I suppose what's new about, well, not, not new, but what's different about what I'm saying is that our way of making the world a better place as an individual is actually our way of contributing to the evolutionary process. So really what, what conscious evolution is, what my message is, is the intentional effort to drive forward our individual and collective evolution. So it's deliberately and consciously leading our lives and designing our societies in such a way um, that it's in line with the arrow of evolution. Okay. Um, and so fundam fundamental to that idea is the idea that evolution has an arrow, it has a direction. And that from a cloud of hydrogen gas to rose bushes, giraffes and humans, that evolution is actually going somewhere. And broadly speaking, you can think about that as an increase in orderly complexity, if you're very hard headed and scientific. Um, it's also an increase in the scales of cooperation. Um, throughout that process, the universe is also getting more creative as, as it evolves, it's getting better and better at evolving. Um, and there's also an ascent into higher and higher forms of consciousness. And so 
those are sort of three or four ways of describing the, the arrow of evolution. And every individual is going to resonate with different parts of that tra those trajectories, and they're going to have different ways of contributing to them, um, either on a collective way or in an individual way. And what I'm saying is that when you find that thing, when you find what intersects your skills with those trajectories of evolution, that's your purpose in life. And if you go about trying to achieve that, that's also how you will find happiness and fulfillment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what uh, came up for me is um, the different levels of development, you know. When you say it's, it's getting, going better, all the time it's increasing in complexity and somehow we hear it's better all the time and more co collaboration and so on. And when you see the normal world of today, it seems absolute opposite. So in, in, that is one thing I wanted to note. And the other thing, you know, how come that you came to this mindset? Because spiritual awakening doesn't necessarily mean to grow up, as we know by Ken Wilber. It's on, you, you interpret it on the level you are. So what do you think, what level had you already been so that you had been able to, 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 to pick up this, this path? Yeah, both good questions. Um, to the first question, uh, yeah, we look at the world around us and everything's um, falling apart at the seams, um, which I completely agree, by the way. Um, so it's really a question of the scale that you're looking at. So absolutely, we're going through a very difficult phase in human history and everything is up for grabs and we might be facing a catastrophic step down um, to a near extinction or an extinction event. So that's a possibility. So it's not that these trajectories or directions are guaranteed and it's not that, it's not that they're a steady state improvement either. So you have step, massive steps back, both in human history and, and also in, you know, in our collective biological history. So we've had five mass extinction events, um, which obviously set this process back millions and millions of years. Um, and yet, if you take a large enough step back and you look at the entire trajectory of the evolutionary process, you can see that even those steps back, they don't reset the process all the way back to the beginning. They, they just slow it down and halt it for a bit before those trajectories reassert themselves and continue on their upwards trajectory. So, and, and really, the choices that we make as a species individually and collectively now determine whether what we're going through now is a catastrophic step back, like a mass extinction event, or whether it's the birthing pains of the evolution of a higher order of complexity. We might be in the process of giving birth to a more complex, more cooperative, more conscious, more creative, unified global society. And that is really what's at stake here is that we're, we're talking about creating, at least from where we're standing now, a kind of utopia or, or a catastrophic mass extinction event. So there's a lot to play for. Before we, you answer the other question, it comes to my mind, um, what we need now is really uh, the feminine approach. We talked uh, shortly about feminine and masculine approach, the, because the, in the innate in the feminine approach is cooperation, is uh, trying to, to, to balance, trying to create harmony. And we have gone so far with the masculine approach to, to go for something no matter what, and uh, and not uh, listen to the signals, you know, which uh, the feminine way is always looking for for readjusting. No, the masculine way is going like this, and it was good. It has brought us, for instance, to the fact that we can talk together. You know, that's it's it's not to undervalue, but now we need the other, and very badly the other part, and to connect it with the intelligence of the mind, and the intelligence of the heart, which is also, let's say, more the feminine approach. That doesn't mean that the men don't have hearts, but, but it seems that they are so wedded to their goals and to win, you know, <laughs> so that they forget all the other rest. While winning for um, genuine uh, feminine is not really the, 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 the topic. The topic is create, co-create, and uh, uh, push ahead life, uh, favor life, you know? And uh, so 
that's really what I'm hearing you say with other words. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and you know, there's no doubt that our the sort of current way that we're doing capitalism and, and geopolitics is, is built on a foundation of, of com competition. And um, that, that we certainly need to address that balance and we need to have a healthy integration of competition and cooperation. Um, but the, the only thing I would add to that is that there's a lot of, um, I mean, I agree with you that, that we do need to, you know, embody and embrace the feminine a lot more as a civilization, as a species. Um, but there's a lot of man bashing going a lot around. And I think that there is also such a thing as a healthy masculine impulse and that we're going to need that too. Um, but, but I agree currently Absolutely. when you look at global capitalism and, and, you know, and certainly geopolitics, it's filled with a lot of hyper aggressive, competitive, yeah. and possibly even psychopathic men who are, who are you know, steering us off a cliff. So it's, it's Yeah, but you know, I don't want to be replaced by psychopathic women. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, not at all. I, I think really the only thing is that women are not competing. And so it's more difficult to go into the, the space. I mean, me, women are not competing. It's not really true, but they on a diff, in a different way. And uh, so far, women who wanted to become uh, public, they had to enter in the, in the masculine way. So we need to, to find a space, to, to offer a space for the feminine uh, to, to, to exist as a peer, you know, and not yeah. only as an, um, something ah, that's there too. Yeah, maybe we do something like this, you know, and that's the one only more, thing. One more way of thinking about the transition, I think, which kind of speaks to what you're saying is, you know, biological evolution, all animals in the biological kingdom, you know, um, they're, they're, the sort of the, the, the top of the food chain are apex predators, you know, you've got a shark, you've got lions, and, and, and they have, they're trying to, you know, basically provide for their sort of, you know, uh, pride or, or themselves or whatever. And that's where humans have come from, you know, we're historically apex predators, but we now have the technological capability to destroy whole ecosystems, reinvent new species and the asymmetric technological power we have is so great that we can't model ourselves as an apex predator anymore. Because if we do so, we're going to start to actually undermine the healthy complexity of the biosphere on which human culture and consciousness depends. And so that's another way of thinking about the shift where we, we can't just go around charging around as apex predators. We actually have to deliberately and consciously behave in such a way that we nurture the and steward the complexity of the whole process so we're not just a part of the process competing with other parts we're actually thinking about feeling about identifying with the whole evolutionary process and we're stewarding the complexity of the whole thing yeah. um, and that is a very that is a very maternal um sort of uh mindset that we're we're, we're, we're thinking about nurturing the complexity of the entire biosphere uh, rather than as an individual trying to extract what we can for us or as a species trying to extract what we can for us because that kind of mindset is ultimately it, it's not taking in a wide enough web of the complexity of the world because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's self-terminating and it will end up actually undermining our ability to survive yeah I, I, I totally agree the thing is you know uh, you are t we are talking insider talk with other words, you know, and that leads to my other question. How come that you already were in this level of development? Because we know that, I don't know how many percent, but a huge percentage of people are not in a mindset that they would think as you think and I think. But we know that this way of thinking is essential to let's say save the planet in some way, you know, to to reassure that we don't uh, have another setback uh, for humanity. I mean, we are dead, but we are not uh, concerned anymore. But we, I think, we have a really um, responsibility, no, for for the continuation of of of, of life on Earth, uh, and we are aware of that. 
but so many people are not. And especially most of the people who are in the leading position and do the decisions. So my question, apart from how come that you uh, had already embraced this mindset, what is your idea to, <laughs> to, def to, to have other people become aware of the immediate necessity of action but which is smart action, which doesn't increase the problem, uh, you know, by thinking to do good, but do exactly the wrong thing. And yeah, I think it's enough questions. You have now some time to answer. <laughs> um, so when I had my spiritual awakening, I certainly wasn't thinking in this way. Um, and I think the reason why I, I found myself uh, exploring these ideas or embracing these ideas is because I never settled, I never felt like I had all the answers and I still don't. And there's a, I think what you're referring to before is there is a, you can have a full spiritual awakening, but be at a traditional level of development. And then you will interpret that spiritual experience through the lens of your traditional cultural worldview. So you might come to the conclusion, you know, if you're a if you're a Muslim, let's say, and you have a traditional conservative values, but you have a genuine spiritual awakening experience, you'll interpret that experience through that lens and you'll come to the conclusion that, ah, you have to be a, a Muslim in order to have this experience. You know, or, or if you're at the stage of modernity, modern cultural values, and you have a spiritual awakening, you might sort of be attracted to something more, slightly more rational, like Buddhism, for example. Um, and I suppose... I don't know what sort of cultural worldview I was at when I had that experience, probably somewhere between modernity and post-modernity, but I never settled. So I never assumed that, in fact, in fact, more than ever, it was obvious to me that I knew very little because of that experience that I'd had. What, I'd, what became obvious to me in that moment is that I'd been completely deluded about the nature of reality in my whole life. And what's more, Nobody had told me that this was possible to have a spiritual awakening like this. So I was immediately, I was immediately aware that there were all sorts of massive secrets out there that nobody was telling me about or nobody knew about. So I never stopped inquiring and learning. And I think that's the most important thing is we're told, you know, that or sort of implicitly our culture tells us that you, you go to school and you learn and then you go to university and maybe you learn a bit more, but essentially you kind of get to adulthood about 21 and then you sort of stop maturing, stop learning. And that never, that, I don't know, I, I never bought that. Um, and so not only do I have a long way to go in terms of spiritual growth, but I have a long way to go in terms of the complexity that I can model in my brain, the, the, the the amount of information that I can integrate um, about the world. And at the same time, my cultural worldview needs to evolve as well. So there's all these lines of development. And as long as you don't ever think that you arrived or you finished or that that's the answer that you need to stop inquiring, then I think you'll be okay. And in my case, at least that manifested in a total discomfort. So I'd had this spiritual awakening for years afterwards. I felt uncomfortable. I didn't feel complete and whole like I did for those 24 hours. And so I knew that I wasn't there yet. And as long as that feeling's there, and it's still there right now, then I know that I've still got learning and growing to do because I'm not, I have, you know, I'm not whole or complete and perfect. Um, so I don't know, I invite anyone out there that has that feeling of discomfort or they're not totally happy or, you know, they have that kind of itch or, you know, maybe, maybe suffering from a mental health problem. Look at that as a sign that they're still learning and growing and evolving to do and that it's out there if you want it. Yeah, and I think this is a good thing if we can um, understand our life as a as a long or shorter period of of learning, and that we the best way of living is maintaining curiosity on the things instead of complaining and you have done something to me and now you have to pay for it. That's where the wars come from, no? But see, oh, that happened. Hmm, what might it be? And what I think we never stop learning and I don't think we ever will be, maybe some people, but in this complete uh, feeling of having it all, of understanding all. 
maybe in these moments, yes. I, I had a very short of these moments too, but it lasted maybe five minutes or so. But I have a glimpse of what it uh, is when you have the impression that you understand everything, although you don't understand the thing because you don't, you cannot put it into reality. But um, these may be the only moments where you have the impression that you you are right there and that you know everything. But I think in real normal life, we never know everything. And so we, we only, we need to get ever more perspectives on things and not get stuck and fight for something which we think is the only truth. I think this is the problem of the world today because somebody thinks that's right, the other thinks that's right, and it's absolute truth. And so we have to fight because uh, if, if this is what I think is right, and you say it's not true, then you are my enemy because you are completely either mad or I have to fight your back because otherwise I lose my self-understanding, my self-image, no? That's, that's mm. what's happening today. And I find it so, uh, so sad because it doesn't need to be like mm. this. Uh, so. and, and that is, that's a big part of the kind of worldview that I'm trying to articulate is that, you know, tradition, the traditional worldview looks at everything that came after it, like modernity and post-modernity is somehow evil and it's lost its, it's lost the sort of traditional values, it's lost the good, homely, you know, devotion to God, etc. Modernity looks back at that and goes, well, that's irrational, and looks forward to post-modernity and goes, well, those guys are just a bunch of sort of, you know, crazy, screeching liberals and, you know, they've, they've, they're sort of up on their moral high horse and post-modernity looks back at both of those as a, from a kind of moral high ground and, and seeks to sort of tell them how they're morally you know incorrect and rejects all the good stuff that modernity and traditionalism brought with them um, and so really the next stage which you can call an integral stage or um, a sort of evolutionary worldview is just the understanding that just the ability for the first time to see the whole ladder and say you know that actually none of these are final resting points and actually there's part of the developmental process and actually, there's really important values in each of them that evolved for a reason. Don't forget, they evolved in a certain historical context to solve a set of problems and that you can't do away with any of them any more than you can cut out the rungs from a ladder. And, and if you do so, you end up cutting off people from, sway, you know, whole swathes of people from further development. So, so I think what we need to do is recognize that it is a developmental process, the way our cultures evolve and our worldviews, and that we, we want to take the good bits with us. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and stop stop seeing it as a contest where one of them has to win. Yeah. And and you, yeah. you, you, sorry, go on. Yeah, I wanted to say when when the the traditionalists say that the orange, uh, you know, they have lost the main thing of life, and the or, the orange say that the greens are are crazy. The thing is, they are also right. There is <laughs> something in the critics is right, but it's not absolutely right. They, they cannot see the, the healthy parts, the good parts. They see only the uncommon parts and which seem to them crazy and the really crazy parts of, of every worldview, you know? And so the critics, we, we have to be very attentive with the criticism because I think if somebody tells you a feedback, there is something in it because they see something in you. I mean, I now talk personally, but the same is uh, in, in the culture. They see something which is disturbing and that might be right, you know, where you went over the, over the cliff in some way in, in your own worldview. So we shouldn't just dis dismiss all these things as, uh, you know, they are only criticized and no, they have also something to say. And that's often what is not, not seen. No? We, we only say, ah, yeah, the, that's not true that uh, the orange people have lost their religion. They have a different religion. That's the thing. The religion of the money or something like that, of the competition, of the achievement. It, it is expressing different, the religion and the, the values, but they have values, although they don't know. I mean... Often we don't know which values we we defend, no. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree um, everything you say. Um, and I think to go back to your other question is okay. So how do we how do we sort of um, 
uh, sort of market, I suppose, that what we're trying to articulate? How do we sort of spread that to the widest possible people? Um, because as you say, um, a lot of people um, don't have the cognitive complexity to really model between systems like that, you know, where they're used to having a system of thought and a value system. And to actually take a step back and see that as part of a, a chain of evolving worldviews and value systems requires a kind of cognitive complexity that a lot of people don't have. And, and indeed, it, 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 it might be quite hard to develop as well. So I've done a lot of workshops in schools with kids, trying to get them to think about climate change from a complex adaptive point of view. So to get them from the kind of corporations are bad and governments are bad and point fingers to a kind of by playing a game theoretical uh, climate change game that I designed, you get them to realize that actually, even if they were in charge of a big company or a big country, it's quite hard actually to coordinate the behavior and to get everyone to align so that we can tackle the problem, you know, uh, uh, unilaterally as opposed to just, you know, one, one nation acting on their own. Um, so, and, and that's difficult, you know, so you do that with teenagers, these games, and, and it's not, okay, they're teenagers, but it's not always easy for people to model that complexity in their head and to realize that actually everything is evolving in relation to everything else and we're all in this developmental sequence. So, so I think the way that I went about trying to solve that, because I spent years talking about conscious evolution in, in pubs, you know, with my friends, um, to anyone who would listen, basically, and, and failing again and again and again to get this kind of evolutionary perspective through to people and I think it was partly because of that it's partly because people didn't have the cognitive complexity and probably because I wasn't explaining it very well as well and in the end what I realized is that you have to connect it to something real that matters to them that they value that they already know that they need um, because otherwise it's too abstract um, and so in the end that's why I went in through this route of examining what people find meaningful because there's a lot of psychological studies saying in order to be happy we need to do what we find meaningful and so then I started to look at what do people find meaningful and when you look at what people find meaningful it is things like cooperation creativity and transcendence and that that is a sort of launching point to talk about the trajectory of evolution in a way that's immediately relevant to something that they care about and that applies to them as an individual and their own individual happiness and well-being. And what's more, it transcends those cultural divides that we talked about. Whether you're traditional or modern or postmodern, you still want to do something meaningful, right? And so if you're traditional, that might be serving God, that might be religion. Okay, that's, that's part of transcendence then, you know? If you're um, a modernist, you might be about self-improvement or, or you might be an entrepreneur. Okay, well, that's about creativity or, or transcending your limitations or getting better at something. Okay, that's very evolutionary. If you're postmodern, it might be all about, um, you know, the love and the cooperation and the, um, you know, looking after um, uh, oppressed groups or the planet. And okay, that's, that's cooperation. That's how we expand the circles of cooperation. So, so no matter what value system you're at, what worldview you're coming at this from, I think there's something in conscious evolution for all of you. And, and at the same time, conscious evolution transcend and, and integrate spiritual and the scientific message so i think it's it's a really good contender for the worldview which can take us beyond the culture wars and actually integrate and unite humanity around in an abstract sense a common goal even if from the individual vantage point of someone at the traditional stage they might not see it like that but if we can articulate that in such a way then actually we can get everyone moving in the same direction even if they don't all agree with each other yeah, absolutely right. And uh, for a long time, I'm together with my groups I'm talking with, we are thinking, how can we actually do it? How can we learn the language of the uh, of the other levels of development to, to bring uh, the interest to them? Because as we talk, it's interesting for people who are our level and not really uh, to somebody in, in the traditional or not even maybe in orange in the modern world, maybe, but probably already green, we would be not feeling full enough for something like this, <laughs> you know? So um, the question is, how do we do that? I, have, I want also to come to your podcast. I have listened a bit to it and I find it, 
very well done, very well done with the music and other voices talking. I don't know if these are original voices from the people you are quoting. Uh, and Most it's very nice, like a, a radio play, you know, you, you hear the, the, the different thing. It's not just one person talking. And also as you are talking, it's very nice, but it's also there. It's for people like us who need uh, maybe a confirmation uh, of their own way of thinking or exploring a little bit more, but it wouldn't, I don't think it would really, I don't know, we have, you, I, I ask you, would it appeal to somebody in the traditional and even maybe in a, in a red, in an egocentric state of development to change or to develop? Just the question. Well, the jury's out. Um, I mean, this is exactly why I made it. So we'll find out. I mean, I've certainly played it to people from the modern value system and they certainly uh, resonate with it. Certainly had a lot of feedback from people who would be from the postmodern value system. They certainly value it um, and it makes sense to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope so is the answer. I, I think so. I think so, definitely. Because certainly towards the end of the series, it gets quite explicitly... Um, uh, religious almost it's it's I'm, I'm saying that we, you know we need to evolve towards God in, in some sense I mean it's not the only way of looking at it and I make clear that clear you know you can also be rational about conscious evolution but if you're a spiritual religious person then actually there's a message in there for you too so I think it would resonate and appeal to um, traditional value system particularly because as they rightly point out the modern world has stripped a lot of the meaning out of life and it's stripped a lot of the important values that they hold dear. And I think conscious evolution brings a lot of that back. It says, no, no, we have a certain duty and responsibility right now in this pivotal moment in history. Mm -hmm. And it and it also it talks a lot about doing what you find meaningful and being of service to others. And, and these are quite traditional values. Um, but I don't the know question is, <laughs> the question is if they arrive at the last uh, episode, you know, of, 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 of the series. So <laughs> it's really the question to how to this is sort of marketing, you know, how to reach the people. And uh, there's this question for you. Who do you think you want mainly um, reach? What, where do you want to concentrate? And, and, and um, yeah, that might even explain then the, the, the tactics, how you are doing the podcasts, which are really, I recommend really, I, I liked it because it's not the normal stuff which you hear. It's, it's really done well and you have dedicated a lot of time into it and it's very serious very very good it's not just blah blah you know like often podcasts are <laughs> well thank you very much um i think initially my thought was to appeal to post the postmodern worldview because that was most of my friends and of course they're the ones who in theory at least are closest to this developmental worldview that we're trying to articulate right particularly if they're beginning to question some of the dogmas of extreme postmodernism, you know, the sort of moral relativism, the sort of, um, uh, you know, sometimes quite judgmental sort of uh, moral priesthood that postmodernism can become. So I think if you're beginning to be a little bit dissatisfied with that, or you can see some of the internal contradictions, um, then, then it's going to really appeal to you. And that's, I suppose, where a lot of my friends are at. They're sort of around about that point anyway. So I suppose I was trying to persuade them but, but the more, like I say, the more I made it, the more I became aware that actually what I'm really talking about transcends all of those, you know, cultural worldviews and, and, and speaks to the good in all of them. So, but like I say, it, it remains to be seen how effective I've been at bringing the traditional um, guys with me. Um, but I've, I've, I'm optimistic. Yeah, you married to to have these people, everyone uh, to to. It's a really a serious. Now they are popping up everywhere. No, these uh, more deep conversations and yes, they are conversations. Yours is different. They are not conversations. They are you speaking and then bringing instead of writing out the stuff, you are bringing the uh, the voices of the the people you are quoting, and that makes it so attractive. So I do think that you can uh, stand out with that way. I haven't heard it yet in this way before, you know. So um, mm. I, I really wish you very good luck. And <laughs> I say to my people who knows enough in English, I also the podcast in German and some of the Germans 
especially those who were growing up in East Germany, they don't know English. So all uh, German people who <laughs> know English, go and, and listen to it because, yeah, and you will find the nice, how can I say, it's a sort of a, a summary of the many things which are flying around and even in our own heads and you bring them together in a, in a coherent, um, coherent way. And that's uh, what I really appreciate. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering yeah. if, uh, I, I think we, we could stop here at that point, but I would like you to, if you have something which you want to say, for, for instance, very important what your website is, where the podcast can be found, but also uh, it, from mm, point of view of the content, is there something else you want to share? Um, yeah, I think, well, so yeah, first of all, you can find all of that at consciousevolution.co.uk. Um, consciousevolution.co.uk forward slash podcast. Um, and in terms of anything else I'd like to say, I think, yeah, so we, we've touched a lot on the sort of individual or sort of subjective changes that need to take place in an evolutionary term. So, so that's both enhancing our cognitive complexity so we can actually be responsible actors in this complex world. You know, spiritual development we've touched on a bit and also, um, you know, developing our worldviews, developing our cultural value systems so that we can see it as a developmental process. So that's all very important, but we haven't touched on much is the sort of collective civilization design questions that, that, that we need to think about and how we can put conscious evolution into practice as a, as a species and, and collectively. And the most important thing is, well, we talked, there's a trajectory of increasing scales of cooperation We've, in human history. Now, when all of evolution, this is the case, and in human history, it's been repeated. We've gone from families to bands, to tribes, to chiefships, to nation states. So we need to find a way to become a global cooperative. And actually how you do that is quite specific. So we need to learn the lessons from the, evil, you know, the history of evolution because the way in which we've solved these problems of cooperation and coordination in our evolutionary past is going to be instructive for our future. And it's no good just wagging our finger and exhorting companies to behave or telling you know, protesting and telling nations they need to cooperate because there's still a game theoretical trap to get over where if one nation goes first on climate change, let's say, or tax avoidance, they get outcompeted by the other nations. There's the potential for other nations to free ride on their actions. And so if no individual nation is incentivized to cooperate to the global level, then they can't profit from doing so either. And so they'll, they'll lose out. So even if it's the morally right thing to do, it's a behavior that can't catch on, can't spread, and can't be coordinated. So there is an organization which transcends or, or overcomes this game theoretical trap, and that is simple.org. Um, you can sign up as a, a CEO giving me the thumbs up. You can sign up anywhere in the world, and it will send a local, uh, send your local representative, your local MP, uh, an email saying that you will give strong voting preference at all future national elections to any candidate in your constituency who also signs up. And so immediately the MP is incentivized to sign up, not being told to, you know, because it's the morally right thing to do, they're actually incentivized to sign up because they don't want to lose your vote. And um, in this way, you can scale all the way up to the global level. And what's more, once we're at that level, let's say they have a, you know, a, a global uh, agreement to tackle climate change or, you know, like in the Paris Climate Accord, um, if they don't enact those changes, then they lose your vote at the next election. Rather than what we've got now, where Trump pulls out of the Paris Climate Accord, what happens? Nothing. There's no punishment to future elections. So there's no incentive for the politicians to toe the line, essentially. Um, and so this uses MPs' fear of losing their national elections to incentivize them to cooperate at the global level. So it's very clever and it works. And you can sign up now at simple.org. Um, there's lots of other stuff we can talk about with regards to civilizational design, but I think let's let's stop there. Yeah, that's uh, it's uh, you know when you started to talk about that, I was writing down John Brunsell, Nick Duffel, simple, and I wanted to tell who is listening to this, watching this. I we did with my late husband. We did an interview more than two years ago with uh, both of them, and also before with John Brunsell uh, alone about simple, and it's really a very, very, very good uh, attempt also to give back the power of vote to people. 
you know, because at the moment, who should you vote? If I was American, oh gosh, <laughs> who should you vote at the moment? There is no, no attractiveness in, in neither part, you know, and then you think you are a good citizen, you should vote. And then you, you named uh, climate change. I don't know if you are aware of this book. I, it's very new. It is uh, by um, Born Lomborg from the Copenhagen um, Consensus Institute, and it's called False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic, Panic Costs Australians, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. That is very, let's say, orange, but it does all the calculations, what the measurements costs and what the benefits is. And I think we should, we should learn that. For instance, you named uh, Paris, um, uh, um, treaty. He is uh, saying how much it would cost and he says the only country that has uh, approximately calculated the costs of what they have promised to do is New Zealand and that would uh, ruin the to total economy. So they are figuring out what to do best, you know, not the hundred uh, percent what we think we need to do but you know, and there are five points to concentrate on. And I, uh, who is interested in the climate change topic, read this book. You know, it's not saying there is no climate change. It's no denial, but it's about how best tackle this problem. And not just uh, at, from now moment to the other, uh, continued with 30 years of false, uh, or not false, useless uh, counterproductive ways of thinking. So. It's, uh, I say it also to you because I'm fascinated by this book. It's uh, certainly, it's leaving out some things, but he is here only concentrating on climate change and not on the other problems, no? So, um, yeah, but yeah, just came to my mind because I'm, I'm excited about uh, th this, that there is now facts out and he's also uh, correcting the interpretation of the climate panel uh, uh, results that he, he is saying what people think in the public media that uh, they are saying the, uh, the it's not true you need to to read it well you know and interpret it without ideology to 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 know what they are really saying because what is in public uh, opinion, what I hear all the time that, you know, nah, I, I don't want to get into that. It's just really good to set yourself in a mindset which is based on re reality and not based on ideology and wishful thinking, let's say in this way. Yeah, <laughs> and there, I mean, there's, it's always good always also to challenge your, you know, the way that you've been looking at things or the information that you've been getting and to see, you know, another perspective. Um, the, the one thing I'll say on that is, um, what, first of all, uh, is he is he saying that uh, climate change is worse than the IPCC is saying, or better? It's less. No, no, he is. It's nothing. He says that the IPCC uh, findings are misinterpreted by the public. By ah, the public, okay. it doesn't. What what is publicly said is not what they say. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's wrongly interpreted. That's what he says. Not that it's worse or something, nothing about so, no, so no value judgments there. It's only, you know, uh, uh, rational judgment, rational, um, deli uh, with no emotional things, you know, no bad and worse. Huh? But uh, his intention is that the cure shouldn't be more disastrous than the illness. So, you know, uh, he, he, he figures out what would be the best steps to do to reach what we want to reach, you know, a clean, uh, and a, a clean planet, a, a habitable planet, but without uh, that the costs for that are creating so many new problems that we can't tackle those then, you know, and that's never seen in this connections, you know. We think uh, for some, you know, miraculous reason, there will be enough money all the time to pay for all that, you know. He's also, uh, for instance, um, uh, evaluating how much prevention costs in comparison to afterwards uh, the damage fixing, you know. 
and it seems to be big, the costs for prevention for floods or whatever, but when you see what it would cost then uh, on lives and on material, when it happens, then, you know, you, you better should do, <laughs> put your money in prevention and put your money in research for real clean energies, you know, and not leave it to the people in their cellars, this research. <laughs> There's also, of course, it's, you know, it's difficult to extrapolate. I mean, first of all, the, the insight there is that there we are between a rock and a hard place. So it's going to be hard whichever way we do it. You know, if we do nothing, exactly. it's going to be painful. If we, if, we, if we try and shift and transition to, you know, carbon neutral by 2030, is that the XR's, you know, claim? That's also going to be horrifically painful and probably too painful. So No, it, so he says it's like impossible. Balance. Doing the math, well, that is, is absolutely yeah. impossible doing Agreed. the math and he explains to you why it is impossible and why we have reached so very little in the last 50 years. Uh, that's uh, because he says we are trying to, to do the wrong things with a good intent, but we are not uh, doing the right things. And so uh, it's interesting because it's opening your mind. You can also see some uh, YouTube clips uh, where, where he asked at the beginning of the conference is three questions. And you figure and ask the people to, to vote for ABC and so on. And then it comes out that we normal, our common mind, how we are educated, we have no idea about reality. We think we know, but it's not. It comes out that we, for instance, when the question, also Hans Rosling, do you know Hans Rosling? Oh, he is wonderful. He, unfortunately, he is dead, but he created a statistics, visual statistics. He is uh, taking the statistics, which you can find everywhere, and put it into visual um, graphics, you know, of the development of whatever. You, the mind gapminder.org is, uh, is, I think, the, the, the website. Really good. But he, you know, he is gone, but he was very able to see that we, to, to de demonstrate that we have wrong ideas in our mind about the state of the world. And for instance, when they were asked, for instance, uh, how many women have, um, girls have access to, to schools or something like this, no? 20%, um, 5, 50%, 80% and so on. Or, so. And, Every time people didn't believe that it was 80% that they could go to school because the statistics show that. And this is a, an easy statistics, you know, then it's not con so much controversial. So I, I recommend to everybody who is listening to that to, to check out these things which are based on statistics and not based on hopeful thinking, wishful thinking. <laughs> so there's two... Um two sort of things that uh, I wanted to pick up on what you're saying. Um, and I want to say them both now so I don't forget them. But, but one is um, essentially about the nature of money or, or, or whether we can have enough money to do these things. And the other one is about non-linear technological shifts. Um, so the, with regards to money or whether we have enough money, um, there's a lot of erroneous thinking about the nature of money. And, and what we forget is that money ultimately is is a human design it's something that we've created and currently our money is designed and created under very specific conditions um, namely money only gets created when private banks make loans um, and those loans comes with debt and interest and that those conditions particularly the debt and interest part they constrain what money can do and what money can't do and so it makes certain kinds of economic activity very difficult, and certain kinds of economic activity very easy. So the example I always give is think of a rainforest. If I go along and I, I want to borrow a million dollars in order to buy the rainforest and preserve it, and the banker says to me, well, how will you pay the interest? So I don't get the loan. But man number two comes along and says, oh, I want to buy the rainforest and I'm going to also borrow a bit more and I'm going to um, hire loggers and diggers to log the rainforest and I'll give you 3% a year. So man number two gets the loan. So that condition that all money comes with debt and interest, that's immediately shifted what's economically possible. And so when we say, oh, there's not enough money for this, there's not enough money for that, I always encourage people to realize that actually money is, should be a function of the state and that we can create money if we want to under any conditions. And we have to be careful about hyperinflation, et cetera. But ultimately what's possible is radically different when we redesign the nature of money. 
So I've actually got a big jumper on from an organization called Positive Money. It says, change money, change the world. So yeah, I, I, that's I totally what agree. Thinking. Totally that's, agree that's, with that. Yeah. But with the one, present situation, uh, I send money, for instance, to, to uh, private people in, in, in South Africa because they cannot even pay any more the, um, uh, the, the health uh, uh, costs for a handicapped child, you know, and things like that. In the present situation, to make lives better, we, we need to calculate where we put our money in, you know. That's, I hope, that it will be a shift somewhere. I think first, I, I really hope in technology, that the technology will really shift into something great, breakthrough, really something better. And not that I'm completely against uh, solar panels and wind power. I have solar panels on my roof and I'm personally completely disappointed. But also, uh, I don't think that's uh, after eight years they were broken. That's not uh, a shift for a whole century and even longer. That's not to rely on it. We need real good different energies. And then I think from there it will be even easier to change the money system because we, it doesn't depend on oil anymore, you know, which mm. is now governing the, 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 the world economy. And I, I would say that first energy comes and then the system change. But in the meanwhile, the people need to eat, you know, mm. and so... <laughs> And, and actually, you know, actually you need a, a certain amount of global cooperation and coordination in order to solve the monetary system problem as well, because it's not, again, it's not in the interest of one nation to go first, um, particularly with regards to a debt jubilee. So that's another idea that is crucial to this shift that we need to undergo is because currently governments are spending huge proportions of their budget every year on servicing debts. There's currently three times more debt in the world than there is money. You've got entire nations that are in pocket to the banks. And yeah. so currently so much of our human energy we're running on this treadmill which is getting faster and faster and faster um which is you know the increasing debt is getting bigger and the interest is getting bigger and, and so we're, a lot of human energy and effort is we're running in order to just stay in the same place we're running in order to not go bankrupt and so that's basically a massive parasite essentially on the human engine um, and so once we get rid of the debt, have a debt jubilee, we'll free up a huge amount of human potential, human energy, a huge amount of natural resources to go towards actually things like the sustainability transition. And um, just one more um, thing that I wanted to say about nonlinear technological shifts as well. And, and what we're touching on here is that all of these things are going to come together. I don't think it's this how it needs to happen and then that because they're all going to fuel each other. They're all going to affect each other. And technology, for example, we are approaching... In the energy sector, we're approaching some potentially pretty huge transitions, um, but but even in food as well. So so they, they now have the ability to grow pancakes, to grow flour out of bacteria. Yeah. So so suddenly we can grow food virtually free of the need for land, or even sunlight, and so that's this massive shift coming down the coming down the road where we've gone from a place of scarcity to abundance in the space of this one technological shift, and so. That's just one example of the, the sort of convergence of massive technological shifts that are coming our way, where our entire way of modeling things and predicting what's possible and how much resources we're going to need suddenly becomes irrelevant. And that, that, that disruption is going to be so huge. And it's such, a, it's such a collection of different technologies, food, transport, energy, everything that we base our economy on, the scarcity of those things is, is the fundamental basis of the way we do everything, economically speaking, and the way governments do budgets and everything that when we go through that kind of bottleneck, if we can find a way of doing so as a coordinated species, suddenly what becomes possible is radical abundance. And so yeah. It's, yeah. it's all those predictions about how much money we're gonna need and how, how, you know, how difficult it's gonna be to provide energy for 10 billion people. All of those conversations become radically different, but yeah. we won't make it through that bottleneck if we don't find a way to unite as a species. And so it's, it's, that's why I think, you know, all those predictions are we need to take them with a pinch of salt and we need to, you know, just, just work on the small hope that there is, the small glint of light at the, at the, from, you know, at the, at the top and, and yeah. steer towards yeah. that. But if you think this is a negative thing, a, a predictions, it's not predictions. It is just figuring out and also for make it clear, you can do something. 
but do the right thing, you know, that's, uh, that's clear. And so the whole thing I want to say, I don't want to have uh, meat grown in the, in the personally, or uh, flour grown in the, from bacteria, because I like organic farming. And I would like to have uh, the, the whole, the cycle, you know, of, of existence. I don't want to have it interrupted by, by only technology. Then I think then we go too much to, to that. We should use technology, but not be a slave of technology. And I think, for instance, if we have what I call free energy, which is not completely free, but quite uh, not like now, uh, then agriculture, for instance, would be much easier and many other things would be much easier. It wouldn't be as uh, difficult. And we have enough production already now, and maybe we can even use less uh, poisons on that, you know, because there are technologies now already there. It needs the will and the decision. And as you say, not only ours, a few of our countries, we, we need to, to connect together. And this for me is the question, not of the whole people uniting, but of the leadership being wise. Maybe of uh, not every country, but enough, as simple says, no? enough countries adhering to, to this possibility and standing for it and working for it. And then, um, then we can reach uh, something. And the, that's the, the, the last question we need let's say, integral leadership, you know. We need people like you stepping up and taking over the younger generation and, and uh, having more insight and coming from that place of a global vision and the willingness to learn if something is, if you figure out that it was wrong, what you thought the uh, day before, that you adopt and try out the next one, which you value as more adapted. We need people like this. So my encouragement is uh, out of the podcast, maybe you can become yourself, one of these people being <laughs> Well, ba baby steps, <laughs> baby yeah. steps. Yeah. Okay. That, that was wonderful conversation with you. I thank you a lot and I wish you all the best with your podcast. It's really, really, really good. And Keep on the, the keep up. Thank you very much. Keep Maria. up the good work. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Lovely to meet you too.